Well, good day, everyone. Thanks, Emma, for reading. And uh, we're using the essential Jesus as a resource. We've kind of pulled that out of the Bible in order that we might have something in our hands that we can use to help other people come to meet Jesus for themselves. The reason that we want to do that is because we are thoroughly convinced that Jesus is the most important and most impressive person anyone could ever meet and you need to know him. Uh, We're spending four weeks uh, looking at Luke's biographical account of Jesus' life. Uh, As you've seen here, it is called The Essential Jesus. I don't know what you think is essential about Jesus, but I hope in four weeks' time you will know for sure. When you think of something, uh, the essentials of something, you're wanting to distill it down to its most important elements. You're wanting to think, what are the key things I need to know about this topic or this person? And when we're thinking about the fundamentals of who Jesus is, we're talking about his life, his death and his resurrection. They are the essentials. But more than that, Jesus himself is essential. He's essential for life. Things like water and air are essentials for us to live. We are totally convinced from the Bible that Jesus is in the same category. He is essential for our life now and for eternal life forever and ever. Luke's Gospel will help us to see why Jesus is so essential. It's a a short little book, but it's kind of a long Gospel There's 24 chapters and we're taking it in four chunks. Four chunks that we think come from how Luke has put this biography of Jesus together. So in the first week today, we're thinking about Jesus' arrival being announced to the world in the first four chapters. And in chapter four, Jesus then takes on his public ministry and he starts teaching and healing and revealing his identity to the world. That's in chapters 5 to 8. In chapter 9, Jesus then turns and sets his face towards Jerusalem and as he walks the long road to Jerusalem, he explains what his kingdom is all about in chapters 9 to 18. That's our third chunk. As Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, he's there with a purpose to lay down his life, to die on the cross for the sins of the world to be raised again in chapters 19 to 24. There are four chunks from Luke's Gospel and the reason that we've kind of taken those four chunks is I think they help us to see the essentials of the essential Jesus. And I want this to be four weeks where at the end of it we're able, with this resource in our hands, with the Spirit of God in our hearts and with the conviction that Jesus is essential, we will be able to share Him with those around us, people in our neighbourhoods and our networks, our friends and our families because Jesus is essential. He's essential because all of us live under the shadow of death. He's essential because shame and guilt engulf our lives. He's essential because our world needs His justice and His mercy. He's essential because we need a love that is stronger than death and we need to know our Creator. He's essential because we are lost without hope apart from Him and He's essential because God has appointed Him to be Saviour and King over all the world, including you and me. And that's what Luke, I think, wrote to show us from his Gospel account. And as we kind of come there uh, tonight to think about Jesus' arrival being announced to the world, here's three things as we try and grab four chapters of Luke's Gospel and distill it down to the essentials about Jesus. We see Jesus' historical reality, His theological necessity, and His ultimate humanity. Let's pick it up with me at uh, verse 1 again, reading from page 7 in The Essential Jesus. Where Luke writes, Many have attempted to put together an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as these things were passed down 
uh, passed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the message. For this reason, it seemed good to me to write, uh, having investigated everything thoroughly from the start, to write something orderly for you, most honourable Theophilus. My aim is that you may know the certainty of the message you were taught. From the very beginning, we're placed in the historical reality of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. This is real people in a real place at a real time. And Luke is writing to to a gospel patron, Theophilus, with an expectation that there'll be a wider and deeper reading of this gospel account, this testimony about Jesus' life that is written in order that you might have certainty about the message you've heard of Jesus being Saviour and King. And so we take this uh, gospel account, this eyewitness testimony, and realise this isn't just some random reflection on the life of Jesus. This is eyewitness testimony from those who walked with him and talked with him, who ate with him and lived with him, who touched him and who hugged him and who saw him die on the cross and rise again. And so ancient historian and theologian Richard Borkham has said, trusting gospel testimony, eyewitness testimony from the gospels, is not an irrational act of faith that leaves critical rationality aside. On the contrary, trusting this testimony is the rationally appropriate way of responding to the eyewitness testimony of the gospels. And in that way, it's the entirely appropriate means of accessing the historical Jesus. So Luke is placing Jesus in the historical reality of his time, his life here on earth. We see that in the second paragraph on page 7, when we're reminded that this was all happening in the time of Herod, king of Judea, Herod the Great. And as your footnote says, if you look at the bottom of page 7, that places us in the time between 37 BC and 4 BC. And other ancient historians, uh, secular resources, all kinds of ancient sources attest to Jesus' life at this time. We know that he really existed and this really matters. The Christian faith does not hang on the idea of Jesus. The Christian faith hangs on the person of Jesus. We are not reflecting on a principle for us to follow, but on a person to be known, trusted and followed as the ruler and king of our lives. We want to know Jesus and love him and have an actual relationship with the real Jesus of history. We're not seeking simply to absorb an idea about an ancient historical figure or ideal. And as Luke places Jesus in a real place, at a real time in history, he also locates Jesus even more specifically, not just in a certain place at a certain time, but in a certain family, with real parents, with aunts and uncles and cousins. We see that by the work, the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is physically knit together in his mother's womb. He is real flesh and blood. His birth is real. His tears are real tears. His friendships are real friendships. His emotions are real emotions. And on page 14 of The Essential Jesus, we read that Jesus really grew in physical strength, but also in wisdom, and God's grace was with him. And yet Jesus' family background is so much bigger than just Joseph and Mary. Luke takes time and effort to show us in chapter 3 the wider historical reality of Jesus' life. Starting halfway down page 16, flick there with me, you see that Luke starts to give us the genealogy of Jesus, the family background, which seems like a really boring way for him to be talking about the Lord Jesus. He gives us a list of like 70 names. And I don't know if you're anything like me, as you start to read a list of 70 names, your eyes glaze over fairly quickly. 
and you get lost in the detail unless this is your jam and you just love memorising names. Most of the names in that family tree mean absolutely nothing to us. But some of them are really significant and they pop out to us like bright shining lights in the sky. And so at the top of page 17, we read that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Jesse. He's the great son of the great King David, to whom God promised an eternal king who would reign over God's kingdom forever. Jesus fits the right family line and the right character for God's eternal king in the line of King David, which speaks not just to the historical reality of Jesus' family line, but of Jesus meeting the theological qualifications to be God's saviour and God's king. And so on page nine, go there with me, when God announces to Mary that she will give birth to a son, this is what, through an angel, God says to her uh, at the top of page 9. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, He will rule over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will never end. It's not just a a historical reality but a theological necessity that Jesus is in the line of David, that he would be the king who would rule God's people with justice and with mercy. God promised for his people that one day a king would come who would defeat their enemies and bring them everlasting peace. Jesus is that king. Jesus is the one who is to rule over a never-ending kingdom and to establish perfect peace with perfect justice for all eternity. Which is very good news, isn't it? For our broken and divided world that Jesus is the forever King who comes to rule the world with perfect justice and perfect peace in an eternal way that no other King and no other ruler ever could. That's why Jesus is such good news for our broken and divided world and for our troubled hearts and minds. That He's the one promised by God and delivered by God in order that we might know peace and righteousness and justice and hope. Jesus' genealogy, as boring as it might seem, actually points us not just to the the historical reality, but the theological necessity of Jesus coming into the world as God's only chosen King. And so when God announces on page 16, just before that genealogy, when Jesus is baptised and God says from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. That's not just a cosy announcement by his father, it's not just a familial note. God is announcing from heaven that this one, Jesus, is the ultimate son of God, the king of God's people. And if you keep going on page 17 in the genealogy of Jesus, you see that Jesus is also the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Again, that's, a, that's huge for the historical reality and the theological necessity of Jesus. Because just as God had promised a forever king, he had promised through Abraham many years before that he would bless all people and would restore the world through the children of this decrepit and infertile Abraham and his wife Sarah, that he would bless the whole world through a Christ, through a Messiah that would come in the family of Abraham. And if we come over to Matthew's Gospel, when he gives us the genealogy of Jesus, that's where he stops. He says, Jesus is the great answer to the promises of Abraham and the promises to David. And yet Luke keeps going. 
He says that's not all. He's not just the, promise, the, the answer to the promise of Abraham and the promise of David. Luke keeps going. Why? Well, Luke wants to keep taking us all the way back through Noah and through Enoch and through Seth, all the way back to Adam, to the first human to show that Israel's Christ, the Saviour King, comes to bring a salvation that is universal in its scope. It's not just for Jewish people. It is for every nation. It's not just people with a Judeo-Christian background. It is for all of humanity. He wants to emphasise what Luke says on page 15 as he quotes the prophet Isaiah to say that in the Christ all humanity will see God's salvation. Because Jesus, the forever King, comes to rule, but he also comes as the Saviour who is to rescue. That's what the the angel says to the shepherds in our Christmas passage in chapter 2 of the essential Jesus. When the angels explode in the night sky and announce that Jesus has been born in Bethlehem, with the arrival of Jesus, this is what they say. Turn to to chapter, to page 12 in chapter 2. The third paragraph on chapter 2, we see that the shepherds are in the field. And the Lord's angels appeared to them. And what did they say? They said, do not be afraid. Listen, I'm here to bring you news of great joy, which is for all the people. Today, a saviour has been born to you in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. This saviour who is born, Christ the Lord, is not born to be the saviour of the Western world. He's not just significant for those who grew up going to church. The scope of Jesus' salvation is as broad as the scope of the human problem, which is the universal problem of sin and death that traps us all under that darkest of shadows that leaves us exposed to the right judgment of God and in desperate need of a saviour and a king. And Jesus is that saviour. And Jesus is that king. And Luke takes us all the way back to Adam to say that in Jesus, God is beginning a whole new humanity. That where Adam, the head of this humanity, failed and passed down to us disobedience and death, Jesus, as the head of a new humanity, will triumph and bring righteousness and peace to those who are in him. As Jesus' arrival is announced to the world, his life is placed within the historical reality and also the theological necessity of God's saving promises to the world. And he is marked out to be the perfect beloved son of God, the new Adam, the ultimate human, the one who will bring about God's new humanity forever and ever. And that's our third point. Jesus' ultimate humanity. We've seen his real birth and his historical line, but at his baptism, Jesus is announced and shown to be the new Adam, God, uh, the Son of God, the, the ultimate Son. That on page 16, when Jesus steps into the waters of baptism, when you think about who Jesus is as the sinless Saviour, it's a very strange thing for him to do. People all around him were stepping into the Jordan River to be baptised as a way of them saying, I'm in need of cleansing. I need my sins to be forgiven. I need a fresh start and a new life with God. Jesus is the one person on the planet who doesn't need to do that. And yet he stepped into the waters of baptism to be baptised by John in the Jordan. Why does he do that? Well, he does it because of his ultimate humanity. 
He does it to say to the world, I am stepping into your shoes in every way imaginable. Jesus is baptised on page 16, not because he needs forgiveness and cleansing, but to say he is walking in our shoes every step of the way to bring about the forgiveness and cleansing that all of us need. We need a new humanity because as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will live when they come to put their faith in Jesus, the ultimate human, the Son of God, the Saviour King. That need is universal because Adam's sin has fractured humanity's relationship with God in such a catastrophic way that leaves all of us affected And all of us are affected by sin in a total and a complete way. Not in the sense that we are as bad as we could possibly be, but that every aspect of our lives is tainted and impacted by sin. We feel it everywhere. We feel it in our relationships to one another and to our world. We feel it in our thoughts and our desires. We feel it in the way that we fail even to live up to our own standards, let alone... God's perfect standard. All of us impacted by sin. To know that humanity has been impacted by sin in such a catastrophic way, all you need to do is look at kids. Beautiful, cute, adorable kids who come into the world never needing to be taught how to say no. Never needing to be taught how to fight with their siblings or disobey their parents. They work that out all by themselves. My firstborn son's a very fine young man. Apologies, I didn't tell him I was going to tell this story. When he was little, and he was fighting with his little brother, and he realised in order to win the fight, he needed to reach for a weapon. And there were no weapons around him because all the knives were locked away. He had to improvise. And so showing that he had some sort of background in prison gangs or something, he takes a sock and a hard plastic figurine toy and puts it in the sock and creates his own makeshift weapon to defeat his brother. I can assure you he didn't learn that from me. (laughs) It was his own innovation, because all of us are impacted by sin. All of us, even cute, adorable children, need to be brought into Jesus' new humanity to have their sins forgiven, their hearts and consciences cleansed and a fresh start of eternal life because Jesus, the Saviour and the King, came with his ultimate humanity on God's rescue mission. We see that Jesus, as he heads into chapter 4, puts his credentials as the ultimate human and as the saviour king on display as God places him in a battle with Satan. Have a look at chapter 4 with me. Actually, let's read it together. I'll read it. Chapter 4, starting at verse 17, where we see Jesus' credentials to be the saviour king and the ultimate human on display. Chapter 4, verse 1, page 17. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan... And was brought by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days, where he was tested by the devil. During that time, he ate nothing, and by the end of it, he was hungry. Really hungry. He was a real person. That was me. I added that. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this rock to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written in the Scriptures, Man will not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up high and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this authority, I will give all this authority to you and the glory of all these kingdoms because it's mine to give. And I can give it to anyone I wish. 
If then you will worship me, all of it will be yours. But Jesus replied to him, It is written, You are to worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, stood him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you and they will bear you up on their hands in case you should strike your foot against the rock. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not test the Lord your God. And when the devil had finished every test, he left Jesus until an opportune time. As God prepares Jesus for his public ministry in the world, he is led by the Spirit to be tempted and he is tempted to grasp at his authority and to grasp at God's provision and use it all for his own self-preservation and for his own glory. And he refuses. He stands up to the temptation of the devil where Adam fell, where Adam grasped at the power and authority to determine for himself, Jesus submitted to the word and to the will of his Father. Jesus, the ultimate human, who, as we're told in the book of Hebrews, had to be made like us in every way in order that he might become a merciful and high, faithful high priest in service to God and in order that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus is humanity perfected in order that he might begin a whole new humanity who will live under the, the reign and rule and care of God in God's presence forever. And his invitation to you and to me is to come and join in that new humanity. To have a fresh start with God, to have your sins forgiven, to have your conscience cleansed and to have the hope of sharing in Jesus' eternal future. He was made like us in every way Tempted just like we are, with one essential difference, he remained without sin. In order that he might be the one who could deal with sin once and for all. The one who could rescue and to rule. Where Adam failed, where Israel failed, Jesus would succeed to be the ultimate human, the real son of God, and to begin for us a whole new humanity that we get to be part of. So here it is, Jesus announced to the world, he is the saviour, he is the king, he is our brother who came for us. Luke is at pains to show us that Jesus comes in fulfilment of all of God's promises and he particularly points us back to the prophet Isaiah who speaks of the character and the work of this servant king who would lay down his life for the sins of the world. So let me finish by reading from Isaiah 42 where we read, where we hear of the great promise of Jesus, the servant king, the saviour, who is strong and who is kind and who is perfect for us. Isaiah says, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on the earth. And in his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is Jesus, 
and he is utterly essential. That's the end. <laughs> Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>